Thank you so much, Kim. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Mark Lockdealer, and uh, today our, our topic is going to be uh, combining H Apache Hadoop and Elasticsearch uh, to get the most out of your big data. Um, we're very, very excited to have our partner uh, Elasticsearch here today. Uh, I, I feel we have a shared vision uh, with respect to uh, big data search and analytics on HDP. So, um, Kim, could we move on to the next slide? Yeah, you can just move on. You have the percentage right. Just move uh, the arrow. Yeah, the arrow is not working. Okay. Oh, there we go. I got there it. Yeah. Go. So, it, again, it's my pleasure to have Steve uh, Mazak here, uh, head of sales and engineering. Um, Steve, do you want to say something about yourself, real quick, please? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yep. Sure okay. can. Perfect. Thanks for the welcome, Mark. Yeah, so as, as Mark said, I, I run sales engineering for Elasticsearch, and I am based out of Portland, Oregon, and uh, I've been with the company for about six months, and, uh, you know, I've enjoyed going around the world and showing people how to use Elasticsearch and get the most out of it, and, you know, obviously how to integrate with Hadoop, so I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much, Steve, and, uh, again, I'm a partner solutions engineer, and uh, a little fact is... Uh, I'm a huge uh, FC Barcelona fan. So with that said, uh, let's get into uh, let's get into the topic. Um, the agenda for today is going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, the modern data architecture uh, and how we envision to do uh, within the modern data architecture. Uh, then we'll actually have Steve uh, take over, and uh, Steve's going to talk about Elasticsearch's role in the modern data architecture, and Steve's also going to give us a demo. All things uh, going well, uh, we'll have a pretty nice demo. And then I believe we'll have about 10 minutes if, if we hit this right for questions and answers. So with that said, uh, let's get started. Um, everyone uh, here at the Duke, um, the, here at HortonWorks, we, we, we're very, very proud of uh, the uh, latest Forrester Wave that just came out. Uh, I wanted to make mention of that before we dove into um, Hadoop adoption. Um, we uh, have been uh, positioned uh, in the Magic Quadrant as a leader, uh, and so we're very excited about that. So if you want more information about that, just, just head over to our website, uh, and you'll be able to get download the full report if you'd like. Um, which uh, breaks down all the uh, distribution players in the market. Um, now, with adoption, um, you know, we actually know there's a lot of hype out there, uh, definitely a lot of hype um, with Hadoop. Uh, but what we're seeing in the Fortune 500 to 1,000 and even up to the 20,000 range uh, is we see organizations jumping on board. And uh, what we're seeing is HDP as a key part of their forward-thinking strategy. Um, so the, the wave is, is, has, has come, and, and we absolutely see that as a part of, part of the strategy. The, uh, the idea of the existing uh, data architecture, uh, that being um, what you've been doing for the last 20 years, um, actually it's been holding up pretty well till now. Um, you know, I, I, I believe that uh, you know, with the explosion and, and the pressure of the new data types that are coming out um, and, and, uh, and everyone talking in, in petabytes now, um, instead of uh, terabytes, we're talking petabytes and, and beyond, um, and, and we're talking about solid-state sensors and, and new types of data, those kinds of pressures, uh, whether it be clickstream, weblog, or, or such, are causing uh, a, a change to the approach uh, from uh, you, what you what we've always thought of as the traditional uh, data architecture. And what's happening, and the way we see uh, Hadoop, uh, we we see it as a plus one to the architecture. So we're not um, blocking out the sun. We're not um, uh, taking over uh, the architecture in any way, shape, or form. But rather integrating. And, and complementing uh, what has been put in place already in your data centers, in your ecosystem. Um, so 
all the data uh, that we've never been able to capture in the, in the past, maybe we've dropped it on the floor, uh, maybe we've only had a year of history, uh, so it's been temporal at best. Um, we're now able to capture and we're able to um, put that into uh, a scalable architecture of storage and compute and we're able to actually get value out of that. So Hadoop to us is a, a complement to everything that you've already done today. Um, if we look at um, a generalized traditional approach um, to uh, working uh, with uh, a data model or a schema, um, we'll look at the left-hand side. Um, typically, um, there's a project launched to do a data design, build a schema, and then, and then we start to populate that, run our queries against it. Uh, very structured um, approach. And um, what we're seeing now uh, with uh, a, a, what we call an apply uh, schema on read, um, we're able to decouple the schema from the actual physical data. And with Hadoop, we're actually able to run the right engine uh, at the right time now with uh, the modern Hadoop HDP 2.0. Um, we'll, we'll be able to run batch, interactive, real-time in memory, and we'll have an iterative approach um, to uh, building and working with our data uh, in the petabyte scale. Um, if, if we look at uh, the modern data architecture, if we look at another driver that we see here at Hortonworks and in the market, actually, um, we actually see some optimization opportunity, uh, significant op optimization opportunity, um, and, and leveraging and freeing up the EDW um, from some low-value tasks, um, cleansing, parsing, structuring, um, we, we, we can't keep 100% of the data in the EDW. At, it, it's not practical. Uh, it's not pragmatic from an ROI perspective. Um, so now what can we do uh, with eight years of data? What can we do with eight years of logs? Um, we, can, we can have all kinds of new opportunity for insight. So that's the other area we see. Um, and most of our uh, customers in the market, uh, if not all, are starting with uh, new analytic opportunities, new analytic data types um, that are driving uh, the initial deployments of Hadoop. And that's where we see most people starting and having significant, a significant amount of success. Um, the new data types that we're seeing and I'm, um, are listed here. Um, I'll give one example, then I'd like to have Steve comment, but uh, I'll just drill in on the machine sensor data. Um, I've personally been involved with uh, telematics uh, and the auto industry and the new markets that are being created um, in that space uh, with the telemetry data coming from each automobile. Um, I'm very excited about um, energy opportunities, whether it be the home meters and their sensor data or even uh, monitoring ener energy grids. Uh, with geo-specific uh, sensors, and one, one stat that I heard last month is that the geo sensors uh, now can deliver um, up to 20 to 30 messages a second. So imagine in the past where um, even trying to capture four messages a second from these sensors with thousands of sensors spread geographically, now we're going to capture 30 messages a second. So that that's where the modern data architecture comes in. But I would like to have my partner Steve comment on what he's seeing in the marketplace uh, with these new data types. So Steve? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, I agree with you. I mean, these are the most common ones that I hear. You know, Elasticsearch is a great fit for a lot of these. Uh, obviously, it's not a great fit for storing video and pictures, but the metadata around those is, is a great place to, you know, or a great thing to put into Elasticsearch so that you can do search, free text search, and, and run real-time analytics on it. And you know, one of our most popular use cases for the Elk stack is 
the logging analytics. So taking those server logs and getting them into Elasticsearch from Hadoop and then being able to see what's going on in your system. That's great, Steve. Um, you know, just a, one more compliment there. Um, obviously, the clickstream data, the sentiment, uh, the social data that's out there now uh, with the Twitter um, and and any kind of server logs. Um, the 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 boards uh, now that are that are on these new uh, systems are generating incredible amounts of data and and to be able to uh, capture information in a preventative maintenance type of a model um, it is what we're seeing so with that said um, here's a list of common business applications uh, and if you noticed uh, I'm not going to read each one of these but by industry we're seeing uh, usage cases uh, that are driving the adoption of HDP uh, and Hadoop in the modern data architecture. And I'll let you look at that a little bit, but the important part to this slide is that we're mapping uh, data, new data types um, to usage cases across industries. Uh, so this is just a, a quick example, and if you'd like to, we, we have lots of information on this, uh, so just let us know. Um, what do we get with HDP2, the second generation of Hadoop? Um, we get uh, the operating system for Hadoop. Uh, we get Yarn. And Yarn unlocks the opportunity to take what was traditionally in the first generation of Hadoop as a single use system running batch map reduce applications and jobs. Uh, now we have the opportunity to run mixed workloads. We have the opportunity to run batch and interactive together with Elasticsearch uh, and other processing types, whether it be coming in as streaming. Um, uh, so the idea is to have a resource manager handle um, the the ecosystem so that we can have a multi-tenant um, environment. So that's what YARN unlocks. Uh, it's incredibly powerful, and we're at the forefront here at Hortonworks and have led the development for YARN to move that into the open source community. Um, we're very excited about that. Um, with that said, once if we look at uh, the journey with Hadoop, what we're also seeing beyond the new analytic app uh, opportunities that our customers usually start with is the uh, overwhelming opportunity to create uh, a data lake uh, with uh, lots of opportunity to drive down cost um, and 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 opportunity for more insight and that that data lake movement is a lot of times driven in our marketplace uh, that we're seeing uh, through the IT side, whereas the initial apps typically we see are driven from a line of business. So that's what we're seeing in the market. Very, very exciting. Um, if you take that a step further, um, you can see that we've gone from line of business, um, from maybe a, a maintenance type application, um, up through to risk management, fraud, uh, out to new business opportunities, um, and we basically see this architectural shift happening uh, in the modern data architecture. Now, what Hortonworks is focused on are really three pillars um, at, at a high level. If we are looking at providing a 100% open source, community-based distro of Hadoop to the marketplace. Uh, we are very focused and we live open source and this is very, very important to us. Um, we also are very focused on integration. Uh, you saw in the earlier slides 
of the integration with your existing RDBMSs, with your existing applications, and with your existing infrastructure and tools. And that is very, very important to us uh, as a leader in the Hadoop space. Um, the third pillar that we are focused on um, here at Hortonworks is helping you to leverage your existing skills, development, analytics, and operations. So those are our pillars. This is our uh, position in the market, and uh, we're very proud of it. The, uh, anyone that will deploy HDP uh, 2.0, into their enterprise uh, is going to expect enterprise level capabilities in the areas of security and operations. Um, we, we, we have uh, and are leading the charge on an open source uh, management uh, uh, capability in Embari to help you to uh, install and configure your cluster and monitor your cluster. Very, very important to us. We've been working with Kerberos uh, for quite a while and a number of other security protocols. And we are continuously uh, working on uh, making it uh, simpler to manage uh, the meta layers on top of the physical storage um, here at Hortonworks. So enterprise uh, focus is paramount. Um, today, obviously, we have a, a, one of our uh, we have a lack, uh, one of our analytic uh, partners with us, um, and Steve with Elasticsearch, and he was, he's going to give you a great demo. Um, but if you're already familiar with the capability, you'll be able to plug that straight into your ecosystem, um, and and Steve will show you how today. And the, I've already mentioned it, but integration um, and interoperability are key for us. Um, we actually have uh, at the application layer the Elasticsearch integration. Uh, I'm going to actually allow Steve to talk through that. Um, so let, let's move on to the next slide, and let's just go ahead and introduce Steve and let him take it away. Steve, it's all yours. Steve, go ahead. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yep, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. So I, I was going to cover really quickly what Elasticsearch is and then how people are using it in combination with Hadoop. And then I'm going to show a, a really quick demo of how you can use it with Hadoop with some, some semi-structured and unstructured data, you know, using a pig script to load data into Elasticsearch and then build a dashboard with our UI tool called Kibana so that you can visualize and discover that data. And then I'm also going to show, you know, running a query from pig so you can use it both ways. You can get data in and data out. And then I'm also going to quickly just show our, our monitoring tool for Elasticsearch so that you can see what's going on with Elasticsearch, whether it's running in your Hadoop cluster or somewhere else. So again, I'll start with what is Elasticsearch, just in case everybody's not familiar. Um, it's really hard to describe Elasticsearch in one sentence because it's all of these things and more. And I think one of the most important things about Elasticsearch is it is an open source project just like Hadoop. And it started out being a, a new way to do distributed search and analytics for the modern world. You know, a lot of times people just want to run one instance of their search server. But as data grows and, and becomes more unwieldy, it becomes important to, to make that search system scale just like you can with Hadoop. And then the most common way to interact with systems today has become RESTful interfaces and using JSON as the data transfer format. So there's a full RESTful API with Elasticsearch. And not only that, but you can use a native language client if you want to. So we have clients for Java, Ruby, PHP, Perl, Python, and more. And then under the covers of all of this is Lucene, which is a, you know, a very high-performance information retrieval library that was written by 
you know, initially the same person that wrote the initial implementation of Hadoop, Doug Cutting. And I think another really important feature of Elasticsearch is it's highly distributed, and you know, you can get up and running really easily with one node of Elasticsearch and start indexing data. But if you want to add more nodes as your data grows, you can just add more nodes, and it's a system starting another node. It will auto discover each other, and now you'll have a two node, a ten node, or a hundred node cluster. So at Elasticsearch, the company we support and build the open source project known as Elasticsearch, but we also support a couple other projects, and we call these the Elk, and that stands for Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. And Logstash is a tool similar to Flume. I think that people from the Hadoop ecosystem will be familiar with that tool. And it's a really good way to get data to Hadoop. Logstash is a really good way to get data into Elasticsearch if you don't have Hadoop. But, you know, most of the people I think on this call will be using Flume. And then Elastic, all that data goes into Elasticsearch from Flume, from Hadoop or from Logstash. And then to visualize that data, you use Kibana, which is a modern HTML5 web application. And it uses the same REST API to execute its queries as you would if you were using Elasticsearch directly. So the company is based in Amsterdam and Los Altos. We have dual headquarters. We support hundreds of companies in production environments running Elasticsearch today. We provide public and training for developers and operations around the world. And we drive the ELK projects forward. So Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Gabbana, we employ all the top committers for all the projects. And we, we drive maps forward. We work with the community on the features that they need, and we get those into the projects. And we just released our first commercial product, which is called Marvel. And Marvel is, you know, the official app to monitor and manage your Elasticsearch clusters. And we're, we're backed by Benchmark and Index Ventures, two of the, the, the top venture capital firms in the Valley. So a lot of people ask me who's using Elasticsearch, and it really takes a simple visit to Twitter and do a search for the Elasticsearch hashtag to see a lot of the logos and names that you see on this slide. I mean, some of the more known use cases are like GitHub, where all the code that we're committing into GitHub as, as open source people or even open source projects, every line of code that we put in GitHub is being indexed by Elasticsearch. And not only that, but then when you figure out how you can do searches on GitHub, all of that, all of that is powered by Elasticsearch. So it's code, it's issues, it's gists, all that stuff is in there. And then companies like, or, I'm sorry, I put this slide up just so that, you know, as an example of what you would see if you did an Elasticsearch query on, on Twitter. So one of the ways that a company that I wanted to highlight is using both Elasticsearch and Hortonworks Hadoop to deal with all the data that just continues to grow to handle real-time search and analytics is a company called Zing. And you know, Zing will be the first to say they're, they're basically like the LinkedIn of Europe. And they have over 14 million members, and all of those members use software every day to update people on what they're doing, update their profile, search for other people, find new connections, et cetera. And all of this data is coming in at a very, very consistent, quick rate. And they need to be able to deal with that in a short amount of time. <clears throat> and what used to take them about 50 minutes when someone would add an update into the Zing service now takes milliseconds. So that's one of the advantages of using the combination of Elasticsearch and Hadoop is that you can get all this data in Hadoop and then instantly send it to Elasticsearch so it makes it available for search on the website or analytics on the back end. So how do they fit together? Well, Elasticsearch is its own process in your environment. It can run on your Hadoop infrastructure or by itself. And the way that you connect Elasticsearch with Hadoop is by using our Elasticsearch Hadoop library. And this is a, a jar file that we've built that's very, very lightweight, and it supports integrating bidirectionally with Hadoop via the MapReduce APIs directly, if you want to use Java, uh, Hive, Pig, and Cascading. And I, I don't have time to demo all of these, so I'm going to demo Pig because I think it's one of the more concise ways to use Hadoop and deal with that data. And when you see the code, you'll actually, I think some of you might be surprised just how small it is to get data back and forth. So this library allows you to do, you know, to move it back and forth between Hadoop and Elasticsearch so that you can take advantage of 
all of the Hadoop infrastructure that you have and the tools that it provides to do email and, and treat that data as you would just like your data lake. And then Elasticsearch is one of the rivers, in quotes, if you will, for coming out of that lake and moving data into so that you can take advantage of search and, and analytics in real time. And it works with Apache Hadoop version 1 and 2. So the binary that you can download off of our website supports Yarn. It's not full support. It's not going to run the Yarn container until the middle of the year. But it, it fully supports Hadoop 2, and that's the one I'm using today. And then Elasticsearch can scale with Hadoop. So there's multiple architectures. A lot of people will want to run an Elasticsearch node on every single Hadoop node that they have in their environment, and that's perfectly fine. You can do that. It's a great way to get data locality because then, the, you know, the Elasticsearch Hadoop library is aware of where your data is stored, and it will load that data locally to that Elasticsearch node on that same Hadoop node. So it's a great way to do one-for-one, one, same hardware, take advantage of all that investment, and, and run both of them side by side. Now, if you want to, you can have separate clusters. So you can run Elasticsearch on its own hardware and have a cluster for each. And the Hadoop Elasticsearch library will take care of transporting that data to wherever your Elasticsearch nodes are. And then you can scale them independently. So if you don't need as many Elasticsearch nodes as you have Hadoop nodes, you don't have to have that. You can, you can scale them completely independent of each other. So. I'm going to get to showing you guys what I wanted to show you initially, which is the demo. So just a few points of setting this up. So I downloaded the Hortonworks sandbox, which I honestly believe makes Hadoop very easy to use. Um, you know, Hadoop is a lot of projects in this ecosystem to make this, this big data platform. And it's important, I think, as a developer especially, to make that as easy to consume as possible. And that's what the sandbox has done for me. So, so I use that to get everything up and running. And then I installed Elasticsearch, Marvel, and Kibana on the sandbox. And to install Elasticsearch, literally downloading the, the binary from our website, unzipping it, and then executing shell script to start the server. And when you do that, it starts one node, and it's available immediately. And then Marvel and Kibana are plugins to Elasticsearch, so it will host those plugins for you, so you don't need any other infrastructure than Elasticsearch to do everything I'm going to show you. And then once I get into the sandbox, I had to upload the Elasticsearch Hadoop jar as a pig storage lib. So that's just a way to get it onto the class path. If you're using something other than the sandbox, if you're using the Hortonworks HTTP platform on a larger scale than just one VM, all you need to do is make sure that that jar file is added to your class path, and then you can begin using it. And then what I'm going to show is indexing a, a comma-separated values file that I found on the Internet that has a bunch of NFL data. You know, Mark mentioned he's a fan of uh, – Mark, what was the team you mentioned? I can't remember now. Barcelona, I think. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm a huge Seahawks fan. I'm still over the fact that they won the Super Bowl. Eventually I will, I will accept that as reality. But I, I – this NFL data because it's a good example of taking structured and unstructured data and seeing how you can get value out of both. And then I wrote a query for Elasticsearch that, that basically takes that data, uses pig to parse it, and then loads it into Elasticsearch. And then I'm going to show you guys a, a demo of Kibana to visualize that data. And then I'll show you an example of doing a query with pig that queries data out of Elasticsearch so that you can use it bidirectionally. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to share my desktop. And then, Kim, if you could just confirm that you can see everything. Or, or Mark, that'd be yep, great. I yep, I see it. Yep. Okay, perfect. Perfect. I can see it. All right, so I – awesome, thanks, guys. So I downloaded the Sandbox, and I'm using it with uh, VirtualBox. Once you start it, this is the home page that you get to. And once you click on Go to Sandbox, it takes you to this. So you can see everything that's running. But you also get these icons up here so you can navigate around and, and start to use the HTTP platform. So I already opened up the PIG – window, I opened up the file browser window, and I opened up the job browser window. So the very first thing that we need to do is upload a file. So I've already uploaded a few. I'm going to upload a new one. And I want to use, I'm going to do the year 2005. So this is all data from the year 2005. And now it's there, so it's called 2005 NFL whatever, CSV. And then in my pig script, I need to make sure that I, I set that name, I change that name in there. 
So before I describe what's going on in the script, I want to also mention that over here, this is where I uploaded the jar file just for simplicity's sake. I uploaded it as a, as a user-defined function jar, and the only reason I did that was to get it on the class path very quickly. You can do it other ways, but this works just as well. And then in here, what you do then is you register that jar file to be used by a pig, and then I defined a shortcut for naming the EF storage. So the alias is EF storage, and this points to the, the pig-specific storage that is part of that Elasticsearch Hadoop library. And then I'm going to load that data. So what I'm going to do is assign it to the variable NFL data. I'm going to load it from this file. And I'm going to say use the pig storage. And uh, it's comma separated. So there's my delimiter. And then all I had to do was specify what the field values were. So you know whether it's an integer or a character array. And then from here, all I have to do is say store NFL data into NFL slash events using ES storage. Now, this NFL slash event is important because this is how you determine what index and what type this, this data is going to get indexed into Elasticsearch. And if you're new to Elasticsearch, think of it in terms from a relational database and how it works in Elasticsearch. So in a relational database, you have any number of databases, like the customer database or the, the user database. And then inside of that database, you'll have tables. And then inside those tables, you have, you'll have rows. In Elasticsearch, an index is synonymous with a database, a type is synonymous with a table, and then a, a document is synonymous with a row. So whenever I say index, type, or document, just think database table, or database, database table, and then row. So right here I'm defining the NFL index, which is, again, synonymous with the database, and then the events, which is the type that I'm going to store it into Elasticsearch as. And that's all I had to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this with that change of 2005, and then I'm going to execute it. Now, as I execute this, I think it would be fun to go over here to the job browser and watch this thing execute. So you can see in the job browser what's happening behind the scenes in the sandbox. So there's no need to go into the command line and try and figure out if your job is executing correctly. You can see it all happening here. And as soon as the, the Templeton controller fires off the actual pig script, we'll see this UI update, there it goes, and now we see that that pig script was accepted and it's running. Now while it's running, I want to see if this is actually getting indexed into Elasticsearch, so I'm going to go over to the Marvel UI, and as soon as this updates, we'll be able to see that that data is getting indexed into Elasticsearch in real time. Let me go ahead and refresh this. There we go. So now I can see that the indexing rate just jumped up real quick, and we're doing 548 records per second. And again, this is you know performance with Elasticsearch and, and the Hadoop Pig library really depends on a lot of what the hardware you're running on, what type of data that you're trying to index, and how you're analyzing that data as you index it. So let's go back to the job browser. It looks like that, that pig script succeeded. The job is done. So I should be able to go back over here and view the results. So I'm going to look at the logs, and for, for speed's sake, I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom here so we can see the, the details. So it looks like it succeeded. It loaded 43,000, around 43,000 records into Elasticsearch, and, and they're there now. So what I want to do now is go over to Kibana. So when you install Kibana and you navigate to it, this is the default window that you see. It's just a really simple explanation of what Kibana is, and it gives you some jumping off points to where you can go next. So by default, we ship with a Logstash dashboard, which is a really good dashboard to start with if you're doing a logging analytics use case with Elasticsearch. But since we're not, we're using the NFL data, I'm just going to start with a sample dashboard. And when I click that, it shows me a bunch of information here. So a lot of the stuff I'm just going to skip over real quick. You can read this if you download Kibana and see it on your own. But the, the interesting thing real quickly is that we see all these different document types. And there's the list of all the different types. Now, this is looking at Elasticsearch as a whole. So there's a lot of metrics or, or types in here that we don't really care about. So I want to clean this up real quick. I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to say, I just want to look at the NFL index. So I hit Save, and now I only have one document type, which is events. But since I only have one, it's not really that interesting to see just the events. So let me add a panel in here. And I'm doing this in real time to show you guys just how easy it is to use. So I'm going to say I want to see the 
quarters. I want to see data in quarters for every quarter of the football game. If I tell it the quarter field, I want to see at most 10. Order them by count and do it as a pie chart. So when I hit save, this pulls back Elasticsearch. Oh, let me uh, refresh this page real quick. For some reason that didn't that didn't work. Let me uh, go over here real quick. Say quarter. Do ten maximum. And then hit save. <clears throat> there we go. So let me close this out. And then close this. So you can see something really interesting right away is that every field does not have quarter value defined. And I can see that if I scroll down here. Oh, whoops. All right, so now we see one quarter, second, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, and we also see fifth quarter, which in football we could just assume means overtime. So now I have some quarter data, but that's not that interesting yet. So if I scroll down here, I'll see a table of all the different documents in my index. And you can see there's a lot of different data types in here, and if you ever look at the CSV file, you'll see the same thing. But there's a lot more interesting information in here than just the, the type and the quarter. And if you notice, there's a description field. And this description field is free text. So at the end of every play, whenever something happens in football, somebody writes in what happened, you know, whether it was a fumble or an interception, a run, or whatever. So what if I want to see something more interesting? So let me get rid of this. I'm going to add a new type here. And I'm going to do a stats panel. And I'm going to call this averages per type. And I, I want to see the averages, so I'm going to say I want to see the average yards to go. So there's a field called to go, and that's yards. And then I'm going to hit save. So right now I can see if I do a search for everything, which is what the asterisk means there, the average yards to go out of my entire data set is nine. So that, that may or may not be interesting to you. To me, it's not that interesting. I want to see what the average yards to go is, for example, when they punt the ball. So I'm going to type in punt, and now I can see the average for punt is eight yards. But what if I want to see that in relation to something like an interception? So I could type interception, but then it's just going to show me where the word interception shows up. But since this data is typed in by people, it's not always interception. It could be intercepted, right? So I want to just do a, a query like this, where it's show me intercept. That way it captures interception and intercepted. Same thing for fumbles. Let's say I want to do fumbles. So I could do a fumble and then put an asterisk there for fumbled or fumbles. And now I see, oh, I'm running into a, an issue here. Yeah, let me get rid of that one and just do the two for now. Since I'm on such a small screen, it's not not allowing me to show everything I want to show for now. All right, so there we go. So we have punts and interceptions. And let's add one more panel just for fun here because I want to see something else. Let's do terms. And let's do downs. And then I'm going to type in here down. I don't want to see if it's missing or other. And then I hit save. So now I see first down, second down, third down, fourth down. I see all the quarters. And a really, really cool thing that you can do in Kibana that makes this so great for discovering data is you can click around and filter data instantly. So let's say I want to see the same data, but I just want to see it for the first quarter. When I click on that, it instantly filters the results, and now you see that the downs instantly change. If I want to undo that filter, I can uncheck this box, or I can just close it. And let's say I want to see what happens on fourth down. So now you can see that punts changed. The average yards to go when they punt is nine instead of eight in the fourth quarter. And now if I would just want to see that on fourth down, I can click that and it will filter it even more. So as you can see, I'm just quickly discovering this data as I go. And I can do all kinds of searches up here to see other things. So let's look for something else. Let's say we want to see um, field goal. So let's do a search for field goal. I'm going to put this in quotes to find the whole thing. 
And now I can see the average to go for field goal is seven yards, not nine yards like a, like a punt or a fumble. And then if I want to see touchdowns, I can do touchdown. And then I can see average yards to go for touchdown is six yards, and that's in the fourth quarter. If I get rid of that, it, it happens to be the same. Let's do a first. It's, it's the same for that one as well. So real quick, let me go in and show Marvel. So all the stuff that we've been doing has actually been generating queries on the back end in Elasticsearch. And from a understanding perspective of trying to see what's going on in your Elasticsearch cluster to understand how fast you can index documents, how fast you can query those documents, all the metrics that we've exposed in the APIs, the REST APIs, are consumed in Marvel. And then we use the Kibana framework to show these metrics in, in a nice way that you can get drilled down really, really quickly. So you can see already that I have some interesting data here. I, I can see that my indexing rate was that when I indexed that data from TIG. And then, uh, you know, my search shard rate is right here. And Elasticsearch uses, under the covers, it uses shards to that data across any number of nodes. And then you can see that there's a lot more metrics in here, which I don't have time to cover today, but you know, there's search request query rate. Uh, I can go down here and I can look at the store so I can see how many documents I have besides them per disk or on the disk, how many have been deleted. I can even look at the memory so I can see how much field is in memory, filter cache, even loose scene. So there's a lot of metrics in here that you can get to per index. And then you can see a cluster overview. So we're seeing some interesting data up here already. Like I can see that my cluster is yellow. And that means that I have one Elasticsearch node running, but Elasticsearch, like Hadoop, replicates data. And since there's no data replicated yet, it's in yellow state. As soon as I add another node and it sees that node, it will replicate the data and the status will turn to green. And then of, of here, I get a lot of a really quick overview of my cluster. There's only one node running right now, but I can quickly see the CPU, the load average, the JVM memory that I'm using, disk free space, and IOPS. And there's spark lines for each of those. And as you add cluster or add nodes to your cluster, you can even look at this in a compact format. So it gets much easier to see all of your nodes in one screen. And then besides nodes, I can also see indexes. And I can drill down per index or per node. There's a few other dashboards in Marvel that I quickly wanted to show you. One of them is called Cluster Pulse. Hey, Steve, are you talking? Let's wait for a couple minutes for him to get back. Steve, are you still online? Hey, you guys, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yep, thank you. Yep, sorry about that. We can thank T-Mobile for that. <laughs> All right, so I, I was just going over this cluster pulse dashboard real quickly. As soon as I'm done with this, I'll show you one more thing, and then we can open it up for Q&A. Uh, so when you're doing root cause analysis with something like a search, this is a really good place to start because it will show you events that happen. And, you know, one of the first things that anyone does when something goes wrong is ask what changed. And all the events that happen in your Elasticsearch cluster will show up here, so you can answer those questions very, very quickly. And then finally, for for uh, Pulse, I'll just show real quickly this dashboard called Sense. And when you're using Sense, you can do lots of different types of queries in here. So you can update cluster settings in real time without having to restart your cluster. You can prototype queries in this view. It's a really good place to understand how the Elasticsearch query DSL works because it was autocomplete for you. And I just have a real simple query in here to look for fumbles. And you can see I got a, a hit of 68. So I'm going to go back into pig, and then I'm going to execute the same query inside of pig. So the query syntax in pig is actually even smaller than, than doing a load. So I did the same thing. I registered the jar file. And then I'm saying load from this index and this type using this storage, and then over here I've specified that same query. 
So you can literally go into Marvel, you can prototype your query, and then once you get the query working right, you can copy it and paste it into Pig and then execute that query. And I'm saying, give me the description field back as a character array and then just dump it. So I'm going to execute this query, and then I'll go back to the job browser. So now we can see the same thing happening. It's going to start up the controller, and then it's going to get that pig script. It's going to execute that pig script, and then we'll see our results back in a second. And again, if I wanted to, I could go back into Marvel. I can go to the cluster overview, and then if I go down to that node, I'll see the search request rate jump up for a second when, when the pig script kicks off. So it looks like the, the script's been accepted, and now Pig's going to execute that script. And then as soon as it finishes, we'll get our results back, and then and then we'll be done. All right, so it succeeded. Once that finishes, we'll get the results back here. And another great thing about the sandbox is it gives you this progress bar, so you know what's going on all the time. I love that about the sandbox. Quickly jump back here. It looks like it's finishing up. Uh, it's doing something because the fan on my laptop turned on. That's always a good sign. All right, so here we go. So now I'm seeing all the results from that query, and this is the description field. So you can see there's the word right there. There's the word right there. And it's, it's exactly what you would expect to get back from that query. And then if you scroll down and look at the logs real quick, we can see the, the number of results that came back. And there it is, 68. So we got the same results back in PIG that we got in Elasticsearch. So with that, I, I hope that was a good overview of what you can accomplish with Hadoop and Elasticsearch together, especially using the, the easy-to-use sandbox from Hortonworks. And uh, I'm going to finish out and turn it back over to Kim so we can start Q&A. Awesome. That was great, Steve. Awesome demo. Um, let, me get, let me just change really quick. There you go. So you guys, I know there's a couple questions. We actually have a really uh, a large amount of questions coming in. Thank you for participation, you guys. Uh, before we go into the Q&A, a uh, couple of last uh, minute calls to action. If you want to learn more about Alexis Surge and Hornworks, we do have a partner page for them. Um, go on there to find out more about the partnership and the technology itself. Um, Steve uh, gave us an awesome plugs on the Hornworks sandbox. So it's actually online right now. You can go download it along with uh, various of tutorials that we have done um, internally here and also our partner tutorials. So you can you know, learn how you connect to Elasticsearch and other uh, partners that we are currently working with. And of course, last, um, if you have any questions or have any uh, comments or feedback on the webinar and whatever you want to hear in the future webinars, feel free to reach out to me at events um, at hornworks.com. Uh, and we will try to get to uh, get back to uh, your questions as soon as we can. So with that, let's kind of uh, walk into the Q&A portion of this. I know we have about nine minutes left, so let's kind of go through it quickly. Um, Steve, this is for you. What is the maximum nodes that Elasticsearch supports? Uh, so there is no maximum, like, hard limit set for Elasticsearch and the number of nodes. It really depends on what kind of query rates you want to achieve and what kind of index rates you want to achieve. And then as you spread that out over, you know, hundreds of Elasticsearch nodes, you'll eventually hit some sort of threshold. And then when you hit that, you can add another cluster. And then we even have a, a special node type called the tribe node that allows you to do iterated search across the clusters. So as long as you have the hardware, you can just keep adding Elasticsearch nodes. When, when you get to that size that seems to be the right size for your data, just add another cluster and then search with the tribe node. Great. Thank you. Um, the other question is, actually a follow-up question to that is, um, do, do we need to load the data into Elasticsearch, or can we still use it from HDFS and somehow point Elasticsearch to talk to HDFS nodes? So right now, the way to integrate is, to do what I did with, with one of the other libraries like Hive or Cascading or MapReduce, and that is to get the data out of Hadoop and, and put it into Elasticsearch and then use it in Elasticsearch either from the, the same Hadoop ecosystem or using Kibana or Elasticsearch itself. So there's no way right now to just point Elasticsearch at Hadoop and say, consume all that data. 
uh, it, it, you know, you have to load it into Elastic using one of the really quick scripts. Great. Um, one question came in from Sanjay. Can you, and this is for Steve and, and maybe Mark uh, afterwards too, can you talk about deployment best practices for HTTP plus elastic search on a separate clusters versus co-located clusters versus yarn-based cluster? Uh, so I'll let Mark cover the yarn stuff, but uh, I can quickly say that we have customers doing it both. They they deploy it one for one, meaning they'll have a, a an Elasticsearch node running on a Hadoop node, or they'll have a separate Elasticsearch cluster running side by side with Hadoop. And it really depends on your use case and what you're trying to do to accomplish with both technologies. You know, if you have a, a search cluster powering your website search and you're exposing analytics to your users in real time, you'll probably have a separate cluster and then just connect them with the Elasticsearch Hadoop library. And, and I'll let Mark cover the yarn portion. Yeah, uh, what was the first part of the question, please? And how did, um, could you just repeat that real quick, Kim? Yeah, he just wanted to know how do you uh, how do you um, deploy Elastic um, Elasticsearch uh, in a yarn um, in a yarn environment? I guess if Sanjay, if you can re uh, clarify your question about the yarn part, that'd be great. But maybe go a little bit into the the yarn capabilities, Mark, for us. Um, I know that you kind of walked through a little bit during your sure uh, your, sure. Session, yeah. yeah, sure, sure. So um, the, the, the YARN capability, first of all, um, it, it gives us an opportunity to, um, in, in industry strength, uh, the environment, uh, MapReduce, job trackers and task trackers at a high level, the, the job tracker was taking care of a lot of work uh, for the entire ecosystem. And what we've been able to do is split out um, using YARN so that um, all of the work that had to be done um, by the job tracker is now handled through different containers. Um, we have the concept of the application master and then the name, name node managers. And within each name node, we can launch uh, containers uh, at the right time for the right purpose uh, by the application. The, the application can ask for resources. And of course, those resources should be launched uh, co-located where the data blocks live as, as the primary choice. Um, but what we're able to do is um, make sure, basically provide an, uh, an environment, um, one that uses um, policies and load. Uh, an example would be CPU and memory. Those are the two um, dynamic indices that we can watch to determine uh, where to launch the containers for each application um, so that we don't overtax a certain uh, part of the cluster. So I'm using CPU and memory as an example of um, uh, routing mechanisms uh, to support a balanced cluster. Um, the, each application, uh, like Elasticsearch, has the opportunity uh, to um, leverage um, the API um, or still just call MapReduce. So whereas in the past, everything typically ran through MapReduce, now, the application developer has the opportunity to just ask Yarn for resources, and we are not tied to um, the uh, MapReduce framework. The the other most one of the other most important things about um, Yarn um, would be um, that. Well, let me ask a question. Someone asked the question. I gave a little bit of an example, but let's go back to the gentleman who asked the question if he had some clarification. Um, no clarification yet. Okay. Um, well, let me leave it at that, and if there are more questions on it, we, we can drill down further. Um, but applications will interface at the YARN level, and they're not dependent anymore on MapReduce, and MapReduce will be just another uh, environment next to Elasticsearch next to any other partner or ecosystem application. 
Great. Does that, does, um, that, Steve, does that help? Yeah, definitely helps. Thank you so much, um, Mark. Hey, Steve, one other question for you. What is the impact on storage when you run both Hadoop and Elasticsearch on the same node? For example, uh, great question. So, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. It, this, again, it depends on how much of the data you're going to be indexing into Elasticsearch. And with Elasticsearch, when you index data, indexing is different than storing. So you can actually index a lot of data in Elasticsearch and not store it in Elasticsearch. And, uh, you know, we also do compression. So it's not always one for one. So if you have a terabyte of data, you may end up with another terabyte in Elasticsearch. But if you're not indexing all that data and you take advantage of the compression that we offer, then it's not going to be a one for one. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Mark, did you have any comments? Uh, no, no, I'll leave it at that. Uh, what were the okay. other questions that we okay. might have? Yeah. Yeah, so Steve, another question that came in for you, I think this is just kind of in relates to the demo you, you just did as well. Does Elasticsearch do in-memory indexing of data? If yes, is it possible to externalize cache settings? Uh, what do you mean by externalized cache setting? Like use off-memory, off-heat memory? Uh, that's, that's what I need to get clarified there. Yeah, so let me clarify one thing. Uh, Elasticsearch does use the JVM heap to store terms in memory as you index them. And that's one of the ways that we achieve our lightning fast performance. And if you if you have a heap of, let's say, 32 gigs, and then you use, if you have more data in there, Elasticsearch will also take advantage of the file system cache to load memory from, from disk efficiently that way. Great. Um, let's say one more question. I think this person has been asking the same question over again. Um, how can we manage Elasticsearch instances at an enterprise level? Is there a management interface to manage the Elasticsearch nodes? Uh, yeah, so Marvel is our monitoring and management interface. And I believe, you know, if you have a single pane of glass that you want to use in your environment, you can expose, you, you can consume some of the metrics that Elasticsearch exposes, like, you know, the cluster status and things like that and show them in your single pane of glass that you might show in your NOC. And then when you need to drill down into Elasticsearch, you can use Marvel to not only see all the metrics about your cluster, but also execute actions like uh, changing the number of replicas or, you know, setting a new uh, cluster setting to disable reallocation while you're doing a rolling upgrade, things like that. Okay. I, I know that we have a, a 20 or 30 more questions that just came in. So um, I know we're running out of time. Folks, I want to be working with Mark and Steve to kind of get through the, the questions you've asked today and perhaps do it a blog, a follow-up blog afterwards to see if we can uh, up, uh, post your the, question, the answer to your questions um, later on this week. Again, this was uh, the session was being record, was recorded and the recording will be available on our website at the end of this week. You guys will get a nice personalized email from me to, um, directing you to the recording just in case. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, events at Hornworks, uh, for any feedback or any questions on this webinar. With that, I'd like to thank Mark and Steve for their time, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us this morning. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right, thanks. Okay, bye. Bye. Take care.